We're here at Homeboy to, to welcome them in. Don't judge them for the color of their skin, the tattoos on their face, and heal from that trauma they experience to learn how to work in a mainstream type business so that after they're with Homeboy for a little bit of time, we get them a job outside Homeboy. And so the positiveness of what happens here in Los Angeles with, with gangs is a model that we know is successful here that is exported throughout the country. <laughs> I'm Benjamin Gottlieb, and you are listening to Shopify on Location, coming to you today from downtown Los Angeles. You know, businesses come in all shapes and sizes, and that's something that Tom Vosso knows very well. Tom left a career as a corporate CEO to run Homeboy Industries right here in Los Angeles, where I am meeting him today. Now, Homeboy is among the most successful gang rehabilitation and re-entry programs in the world, helping these folks rebuild their lives through employment. And it's also on Shopify. Tom, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, Benjamin, good to be with you. It's good to be with you too. So Homeboy started out basically as a job training program, right? This is in the late 1980s, but it's become so much more. Um, can you walk me through how that transformation really took place? Yeah. And so in short, our founder, who's, who's still with us, Father Greg Boyle, Jesuit priest, his first stop as a parish priest was at Dolores Mission, which happens to be the poorest parish in, in all of Los Angeles archdiocese. And that was back in the early 90s. And in Los Angeles in the early 90s had a massive epidemic of gang violence. And, and right where Dolores Mission was, was sort of the epicenter of all that gang violence. And so uh, Father Greg wanted to figure out a way of how do you get these young men out of gang life? And hit upon a simple notion, which is, seems so obvious now, is that if you can get them a job where they can make enough money for food and shelter, they're not going to turn to their gang to make the money for food and shelter. And so it started as a jobs program. And then they, they, he started with his first business was making tortillas in Grand Central Market, but then really led to having its first business, legitimate business of a homeboy bakery, which we still have today. And I just love sort of how Father Greg approached business at that point. It wasn't about how much business they did, but it was to, to not bake bread to hire homies, but to hire homies to bake bread. So the whole point was let's grow the business, provide more job opportunities, for these men, young men, to get so they can get out of gang life. Right. And you mentioned the bakery. I think if even folks who don't know that much about Homeboy or if you drive around Los Angeles, you've probably seen the sign Homeboy Industries and the bakery. Uh, it's very well known, that image. It's iconic here in Los Angeles. And as you mentioned, it's become so much more since. You know, for this series, Tom, we've been talking a lot about uh, Los Angeles and the positives. And Homeboy really keys in on a negative history, kind of a a tough part of Los Angeles, the rougher side. Um, how would you say LA specifically has influenced Homeboy and could this happen anywhere else? Certainly uh, LA County. So Homeboy Industries is the largest gang rehabilitation program in the country, right? And that's because LA County has the largest gang population in the country and then thereby the world. And so unfortunately LA has exported gangs uh, to around the country and the gang culture, and even to South America and even some of the uh, European countries. But if you take the flip side of this, and if you think about what Homeboy represents in that we stand with the demonizing until demonizing stops. As they leave the prison system, you know, all these folks, they don't want to go back and join the gang and do crime. They actually want to earn a decent wage pay for their decent labor of each, of each day. And so we're here at Homeboy to, to welcome them in. Don't judge them for the color of their skin, the tattoos on their face, the gang they're in, or the felony they did, but to help them come in and heal from that trauma they experience. But along the way of healing is give them job skills because they've never had a job in their whole life. And so we now are enabling them to learn how to work in a mainstream type business so that after they're with Homeboy for a little bit of time, we get them a job outside Homeboy. The positiveness of what happens here in Los Angeles with, with gangs and how you rehabilitate gang culture is a model that we know is successful here that uh, is exported throughout the country. So the exporting of, unfortunately, the gangs, but also of these potentially one of the solutions, employment for folks who are you got it. have grown up in this. And you know, our audio engineer, Matt, and I were down in the cafe before we came up here. We had an iced tea and you could see just the the energy, all the, the folks that 
very visibly are former gang members working in the cafe, cooking, serving. Uh, there's lots of energy here too. We're right smack dab in the middle of downtown Los Angeles. I think this is Alameda Street exactly. to my right. We've got the Metro, just heard cars whizzing by. Um, it's very frenetic here. Right, and I like how you frame that up because here we have our homegirl cafe. So uh, in gang life, it's 90% men, 10% women. But a homeboy, it's about two thirds, one third, because we know a lot of women are, are hanging around gangs as well. So we have this homegirl cafe started a number of years ago for more of a women's only business. A homegirl cafe is zagat rated. There's only seven other restaurants in downtown Los Angeles with as high as a rating. And it's fully run by felons and gang members. And just sit back and think, it's not like this, I'm, I'm a professional manager, I'm CEO here, but it's not like we have professional management running the cafe. They're running it themselves. And, and in all our businesses, 90% of our management team are former clients. Like most businesses and nonprofits, the people that work for you are a big part of the identity, the social fabric, the, the juice, right? The special sauce of, of Homeboy, right? Of your business. And I would imagine working at a place like this, you have some incredible stories of the people that work for you. Is there any that you'd like to share? Oh, sure. I mean, I've learned so much from the people who are here uh, in many ways. So let me tell you this story. When I first joined Homeboy, I was walking through our bakery. We make artisan bread. There's nothing better about getting rival gang members to get along with your other as then when they're standing at that table and rolling dough with their rival gang member. Making a holler or a bagel or- You right? got it. And they, <laughs> and they have to get along and it works. It breaks down all the barriers. And so, you know, individual relationships make a difference. But as I was walking through the bakery this one day, I heard, overheard George talking to one of our, uh, our bakery manager. Now, George goes to our farmer's markets. In LA, there's 26 farmer's markets. We send our guys out. They set up shop at a farmer's market, sell our goods. And, and come back. And George is one of our better sellers. And so I heard George talking to the manager asking if he can have Friday, Saturday, and Sunday off, which are our three busiest days. And me being the new guy, you know, I after the dialogue's over, I go up to George and try to be friendly. I said, hey, what are you doing? Thinking, are you going away? And he looks at me and says, oh, I'm, I'm reporting in. Reporting in? What's that mean? Well, I'm reporting at the county jail for the weekend. And he went on to explain that he came out of prison and these folks come out of prison, they have massive amount of debts, restitution debts, they gotta pay for the court costs, their parole officer, so it's crazy as, for me it's crazy society throws so many debts upon somebody while sure. they're in prison, they can't earn away that money. At that time, the way you can kinda work down what you owe is you can report in and spend three days in county jail and, and cut your debt in half. I left that conversation stunned that here's George trying to do the right thing. He could have went to his gang members and borrowed money, but then he would have been in debt to them and in some type of awful way. He could have gone to a loan shark and borrowed money, but he didn't because he knew that was just going to put him further behind. So he decided to report in. So I think about it all weekend. I see him the following Tuesday. I, I go up to him and say, George, how'd that go? And then I see stress all over him. It turns out he got out of prison and he was able to get custody of his two children, 10-year-old and 8-year-old. And he was going to have a caregiver come to stay with his kids and watch him. Caregiver at the last minute couldn't make it. He has no family support. He didn't want to go back to his homies. And so, and he still committed to go to report into jail. So he went into jail leaving his 10 year old, eight year old alone in their apartment for three days. Obviously the whole time while he was in jail, he was so worried about what was happening to sure, his children. Punchline of the story is the kids end up being fine, right? right? So, I'm, but in talking to him, it's like, what an impossible choice. So we, in the rest of our society thinks, oh, we're gonna start, in our minds, we start judging. Oh, that was a bad decision. You should have found some other way. But I just wanna pause and I, I had to go learn. So wait a minute, first of all, Tom, you just have to appreciate that the working poor in our society have so many challenges. It's just so many tough choices to kind of get through. They can live a quote unquote straight and normal life. And the second thing is, don't judge. You can't put yourself in that situation. It's just so hard to imagine. And to realize that the working poor need a different set of support services around for them to thrive in their workplace along the way. And so that was an important story for me to keep communicating. If we're trying to kind of help society go forward, if we're trying to get more people to work who haven't been in the workforce before, we got to think how we can put a support structure around of maybe giving George's zero interest loan along the way. Yeah, I was kicking myself after the whole that whole week thinking I should have offered that. I should have, how can I have kind of pulled money out of my pocket to help along the way? But there's so many dynamics to that story that just it's so important for us to 
sit back and think, hmm, what are we doing to help people? This is as good as a workforce as any workforce I've ever had. And if you give them the chance, they're loyal and they're going to do a good job for you. And you're not just saying that to me. You've also said that in a recent book that you just put out last year. It's called The Homeboy Way. And you describe it. It's on the cover here, a radical approach to business and life. Yeah, I, I think that's a radical approach to business and life, hiring former felons and gang members to run a successful business. But actually, you're arguing in this book that, hey, wait a minute, this is actually a big unlock for a number of small businesses or larger ones out there. Oh, well, uh, for sure. You know, so look, I came from a big business. I ran a, a, essentially a $2 billion business in the for-profit sector. And at, as I left that, there's only a certain shelf life to be a corporate executive. I left that and a friend of mine invited me down and have lunch at the Home Girl Cafe. And I'm um, having lunch and he's trying to get me involved and be a board member. And I'm looking around, just like you said you did, you see a, a good energy among the workforce. They're smiling with each other, interacting with customers. And I'm thinking to myself, as I'm eating lunch, in my for-profit job, I would have never hired any of those people because <laughs> we have restrictions on hiring felons. And so as he asked me to get involved, I'm like, I have to get involved to see what this is about because I would have never hired these folks. And you know, here's a, a population that society has forgotten, businesses sort of forget. And what I'm here to say 10 years later is that not only is it good for your business because they're going to be loyal employees, we are measuring making an impact on society because if we don't hire these folks, they're back on the streets running with the gangs, and then it's a, it's a spiral downward. And the other thing I want to say is, look, poverty rate in America has been the same for 45 years. We need to do something different. And what I've learned at Homeboy is by taking the chance, the hiring people, the working poor, and giving them a support structure around, as again, they're, they're good employees, and that's going to change how society grows and evolves so we don't have as many poor people in our, in our midst. You mentioned kind of doing something different um, with Homeboy and, and with your own career. Uh, a lot of folks that listen to this podcast are considering the same thing. Uh, maybe they're working a job they don't like, uh, in an industry they don't like, and they go out and try to make it on their own. Um, you've kind of done this a little bit differently. You've perhaps achieved the pinnacle of American corporate life and decided, wait a minute, I got to go in a different direction. Can you walk us through how you made that leap? That must not have been easy. I kind of knew, in the, look, in the for-profit world, uh, you have these rules of the game. You knew, And within those rules, I was going to work really hard and succeed, and we did. Uh, my businesses were always successful, at the top in the public class there. But along the way, there's this tension between shareholders and employees. And well-run businesses keep those in balance. But in times of stress, shareholders <laughs> went out over employees. Sure. And I kind of figured there's got to be a better formula. Again, started volunteering at Homeboy, and I learned at Homeboy, it's not about shareholders. It's about being here for our workers, for our people, and having successful business so they can live their life dreams come true via that business. And so I would like to encourage everyone listening to this, as you're in a business, you can make those changes. You, you know, There's always going to be shareholders. you got to kind of do that. But also, how do you make this a great place to work for the people that you have underneath you? And how do you allow them to make their dreams come true? And it starts while you want to do that. Everybody's got that intention. It starts with finding your own joy and your own balance in your life and recognizing that joy happens through other people. And that can happen in the workplace. It's not, it's not in nonprofit organizations. But how do you have a, a more complete workplace where you see people as people, not as numbers? That might seem like a trite lesson, but I just witnessed it outside before we started this interview. You were chatting with, I would imagine, either an employee, colleague, um, and I was like, hey, time to do the interview. Like, you know what, uh, Benjamin, just very politely, give me a minute to give that employee their time to say what they needed to say. Again, sounds like maybe a trite piece of advice, but I would imagine that's been really successful for you. No, without a doubt. Look, I, I came into Homeboy with all the hubris of a corporate executive, and uh, but I came to learn Homeboy is about relationships. And so as you're standing in front of someone, when someone walks into your office and ask you a question, a homeboy or homegirl, you learn to be centered and focus and be right with them. In the corporate world, as you're talking to somebody, you're in a hallway, you're chit-chatting, there's like 10 other things rolling in your brain. Oh yeah. But here it's like, oh no, no, it's about being authentic and being there for the person, having that dialogue and then moving on. And that's been successful for you here as CEO. You mentioned again that you came from this corporate world, CEO of Aramark, big company uh, based on the East Coast, I believe. And um, at the same time, here you come to Homeboy, you've brought some of those skills with you to this experience. I mean, correct my math, but you've doubled the size of Homeboy since you started. 
Uh, can you talk about how you were able to kind of build up the offerings, the brand, and the employment over here at Homeboy? A lot of the skills that make you successful in the for-profit world make you successful in the nonprofit world. You know, it's about having the right strategy, the team in place, the implementation, uh, w- without a doubt. And so coming into Homeboy, it was a nonprofit, very mission-driven. People care so much about it. And you know, we are very successful helping people leave the gang life behind, right? And so we have a lot of over half of our team, again, our former clients. So they have the great idea of leadership and mentorship but not the training of management training and functional skills. So what I was doing was- So you bring, provide that. So I provide that and I bring in other uh, workers. So we blend inside and outside talent so we can grow. And I also saw that Homeboy's got a, a good brand. We represent sort of transformation and how kinship and compassion, those are the words we use that come through with the way we approach our own social enterprises as well. So it's a matter of how do you advertise that brand how do you get people in the right spot to take on the work? And then what happens? Growth happens. Growth, growth is there. Well, we're going to talk about branding in a moment. So hold that thought. I'm chatting with Tom Voso, the CEO of Homeboy Industries. And before we continue, just a quick word about our show. Shopify Masters is only possible because of listeners like you. You keep us going and we want to keep making content that you like. So do us a favor, subscribe to our show wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a review. We really appreciate it. You mentioned again, branding. You're right. Homeboy does have a very strong brand. You have a bunch of social enterprise operations as well. The bakery, the cafe, electronic recycling service, merchandise, which is what you are selling on Shopify. How do you continue to build, let's just say, brand awareness and recognition for your products online in particular? Yeah, and we want to do a better job at it. It's been growing. It was word of mouth. We have a great uh, brand in terms of how people see us as the human services agency. And, you know, our whole point is to buy products with a purpose. So you can buy baked good items online from us. You can buy merchandise items online from us. You can buy them from other people. But when you buy from us, you're buying from people who actually wouldn't have a job anywhere else. And that it's, it's having those more sales, more job opportunities that allow us to help more people who society forgets and society demonizes. So As we're trying to put our branding out there via our products, it's about people's dollars can make a difference in moving people's lives forward by purchasing with us. So in other words, uh, if you're looking to spend your hard-earned dollars with a social responsibility aspect in mind, Homeboy is a good fit for you. Exactly right. So uh, one of the big part of these social enterprises is the job experience that you provide, right? I'm just curious, how important to you is physical visibility of Homeboy, having your brand out there on the streets? What part of that does it play in um, what you're trying to do? You know, it plays a big part. It's the the logo of the brand, but an equal part of that is the stories. And so we help 8,000 people a year. We help hundreds of people each day. And when our folks how they transform their life is once they own their own personal story and when they're able to tell it. And they tell it in the context of how Homeboy has helped them move it forward. That story with the products, with the brand symbol, kind of all comes together and makes it work. Storytelling, it's a big part of what we're doing and it's a big part of every successful business today, especially online, uh, because that's where people are hanging out. I would imagine that you have um, a team that's working to kind of put some of these stories when folks are ready to tell their story out into the world. What's that process been like for you and how have you seen it be successful? Yeah, it's uh, so we, we put it out on our on our web channels. Uh, we have Instagram and we have uh, our own website and our Facebook page. Uh, what we do also every morning, which is pretty unique, and, and as a former corporate guy, when I first saw this homeboy, I said, that, that that's it. Every corporation thinks about how do you maintain it, your culture. And so what we do is every morning we have what's called our morning meeting, where we all gather in the central space. The homie reads the, the mission statement. When you say we all, how many people are we talking about? Uh, we're talking over a hundred people <laughs> gathering. And this, is, this is a big building, but it's not enormous, It's right? not enormous, yeah. right, right. And so, and then we also have people zoom in for it as well. So we, we read our mission statement. We do announcements. We announce the class schedule for the day, but we announce people's birthdays and we sing happy birthday. And so many of these men and women have never had happy birthday sung to them. And then we do a thought of the day and it's rotating a thought of an affirmation, what they feel like. And then we end with a prayer. And we're not a religious organization, but it's a rotating 
pray to whoever God you want, however you want to do it. It's not always articulate, but it's always heartfelt. What we've done though, is we've put that whole instance online mm. and it's amazing the number of people who sort of tune in, who are not necessarily part of Homeboy in our facility, but they kind of are part of our greater Homeboy community. And that part of the storytelling really moves us along in terms of reinforcing our brand. Tom, I can't help but think about how the pandemic must have affected you and your nonprofit here uh, to cultivate that sense of community. Can you walk us through how that changed the way that you approach some of these things for good and, and for, for worse, perhaps? Sure. And let me put a further context to this. You know, when people are trying to leave gang life behind, that means they're leaving their neighborhood. And when they're trying to leave gang life behind, that means they're leaving their family. Because mostly these folks we work with are second, third generation gang members. So their father was in a gang, their mother was in a gang, their uncle was in a gang. And so as they're trying to leave that behind, they got to leave their neighborhood, leave their family and come to us. We're in central part of the county. We take people from all over the county. So we really do become a sanctuary for people where there's safest spot in their day. Uh, and that in, disappeared. In our building. That, and that had the potential of disappearing when that pandemic was coming down. I'm still thinking March of 2020. Sure. When that pandemic comes down, we think we have to close our doors. What are, the, what are our folks going to do? And so within two weeks, we, we closed for two weeks. And then thankfully, the, we know enough people in the city, we were able to have an exemption for us to stay open as a gang intervention program. And so we stay open. So, and, and God bless our team, a dedicated team of managers and, and leaders. They knew how important it is for people to show up. And so they came in themselves, the, the man, the operation. Now we did it in a safe way. We had masks, we had distancing. And then slowly as each, each turn of the pandemic went along, we were there with it. Like we were the first organization in Los Angeles, first non-business, non-government to have a vaccine clinic. Uh, very early on along the way. Uh, and so so we know how important it is to stay open and keep operating similarly with our businesses. We pivoted our homegirl restaurant into a Feed Hope operation where the women of, the, of the, our cafe came to us right that first month and said, listen, we have food in our storeroom and our refrigerators. Can we come in? Let's do something with it. Make up the food and hand it to our community who's, who was food insecure. And we said, absolutely. A board member found out they raised four hundred thousand dollars to keep that going. We eventually got a city contract to keep that going. So we we pivoted our businesses. But while we did a good job on the business side and mm -hmm. fundraising side through the pandemic, because I think people in society recognize how hard it is for people who don't have housing, don't have food security, how hard it is to live. So people have been enormously generous these last uh, number of years. It has been the hardest on our population we serve. Listen, people join gang life because they don't have a family support system. They do crime because they don't they don't mind going to jail because they don't see themselves living past 30. But, and in this pandemic, what came back was this sense of hopelessness. And so within that first year, we lost 30 people. Killed domestic violence, gun violence, gang violence, drug overdoses, because it was this sense of hopelessness that pervaded out there. We went overboard to keep our doors open so that then we can provide that hope to keep people coming back in. And really, we pushed the boundaries of what was appropriate in the pandemic so that we can actually serve and help more people. And thankfully, again, the donor community was very generous. The, our business customers sort of kept buying from us because I think they see the value of you got to stay open. You got to be being able to be there for that person. That, that structured part of a job is so very important for people to have hope as they move their life forward. What a dichotomy, right? I mean, you have folks that really need this place to help take them away from the place they're from. At the same time, you have these external forces that are calling for you to shut down. Sure, and you, you heard from the county and city level, you know, shelter a home, right, during the pandemic. Well, sure, you can't course. shelter a home if you don't have a home and you don't have a safe home. That's the kind of the, the challenges we were facing. So. At that same time, I would imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, I would imagine that you were also exploring ways to sell some of your merchandise online a little bit more aggressively, right? People weren't shopping in stores for a while. We couldn't go into a store to shop. Um, and I'm sure you had conversations about that. What was that experience like? And what did you take away from that that has been helpful for you? It might be helpful for folks listening. Yeah, we're now a $30 million nonprofit. And I'm quick to say we raised $30 million, We spend $30 million each and every year. 
Uh, but all of that 30, all, you know, less than 10% comes from the government, federal, state, county, city. So which means we got to make up 90% on our own through donations and business revenues. And so we knew we had to kind of be on top of uh, moving our businesses forward. And so online was a way of making it happen. And so we put more of our bakery products online. Uh, we put some of our cafe products online, moved some of our merchandising products more online. And, uh, you know, that's why we used the Shopify to kind of get us there pretty quickly uh, to make that all happen. Because, listen, we're a nonprofit organization. We don't have an IT department to kind of create websites. You know, we, we're, we're a bunch of nonprofit folks who experts are helping people leave gang life, not necessarily experts about all the other back end parts of a business. So shameless plug, Shopify made it rather easy to get right, that going. Absolutely. And, you know, I purposely gave you the plug because <laughs> I turned to other teams and said, how are we going to do this quickly? Right. And that's where Shopify came along. And so um, have you have you found it to be successful? I mean, what what has it been like to use the platform? Are you, I would imagine you're not physically involved putting things online, but I would imagine you might be training some of the folks who are former gang members to do this. Kind no, of stuff, definitely right? training the folks, former gang members who are doing this. You know, we, we've moved a lot more of our bakery products online. We're moving some of our, uh, we have an electronic recycling business as well, where right. we take on people's electronic waste. We fix it up and then we resell it online again. And so what's interesting is actually teaching people to use the technology to make business happen. And you know, makes for, for a guy like me who's in this to see people thrive in their in their jobs, it is kind of cool to see former gang members thrive in terms of, hey, they're gonna put products online to sell and they're gonna key in the words of what that electronic product is, what's the price we're gonna sell it for and how that works. I would imagine in some ways it's also part of the skills building, the job training that you're providing here. At Absolutely. Homeboy as well. well, Tom, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. That's Tom Voso, the CEO of Homeboy Industries. Thanks again. Thank you for having me. Shopify Masters is produced by Megan Coyle and Gogo Zoger. Our engineers are Matt Schwartz and Miku Betlam. Our host is Shwang Esther Shan, and I'm Benjamin Godley. Come hang out with us next week, same time for more episodes from Los Angeles. <laughs>